Talking with the Experts. Hello and welcome to Talking with the Experts. And today my guest is Tyron Giuliani. And Tyron is a fellow Australian entrepreneur, but after being injured and suffering a permanent disability while in the Australian Army, Tyron left Australia on a whim and moved to Tokyo in Japan. He had one suitcase, no friends, no family, no Japanese language skills at all. And fast forward 22 years and he is still there, speaks Japanese like a three-year-old, but has co-founded, founded and partnered at three seven to eight figure businesses from starting first business servicing weddings as an ordained minister to providing wedding dresses uh, over 420 weddings a month to working with 67 fortune 500 companies to build their management teams in asia well that's um, a pretty impressive resume tyron welcome to the to the program yes thank you rose and hearing it back makes it sound better than I am. <laughs> but I'll, take it. I'll take it. Yeah, for sure. So today we're talking about selling made. No, that's your business. Um, we're talking about uh, starting business abroad, weaknesses and strength, transforming LinkedIn from resume to landing page for client acquisition. Mm -hmm. So tell me a little bit more about selling made social. Yeah, so you know, my background has has generally been working within the B two B space. So getting uh, corporate clients and in a number of different businesses that I had. One of them being in the executive recruitment business. I was a partner in a firm, and we chased after foreign companies that were operating here in Tokyo, because in Tokyo, that's the center of Japan, um, and. And pretty much every global corporation, they have an office here in Japan. They need to be serviced and they want to bring in management teams. Sometimes I bring them from overseas um, and they need people to be able to kind of match up the executive with people that are going to kind of get on with the locals as well and run their businesses. Uh, so I did that for many years and, and we actually got our company, we got bought and then we went public on the Tokyo Stock Exchange, which was really cool. And at that point, I, I exited. And um, I, I have other businesses, but I, I love to keep busy. And I was thinking to myself, like, what do I really want to do next? I want to go more online and do more business and, and delivery, the attraction, the conversion and, and, the, and the fulfillment online. And I joined a couple of masterminds and we had some projects and some of the guys said, okay, now we've got to go get the clients to execute the project. I said, yeah, no worries. We'll go to LinkedIn and we'll do that. And they're like, how? I'm like, what do you mean? We just do da 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 And they're like, <gasps> Wow. I'm like, <laughs> really? Like this was like second nature for me. It was my bread and butter for years. You know, our firm, we pulled out over 22 million bucks in fees organically off LinkedIn. Um, so, you know, it was like a no brainer. Uh, and then I quickly realized, well, there's a gap here um, that a lot of these small business owners, they're in the B2B space. They really don't know how to effectively put in a sales funnel on LinkedIn and then the other thing I, I quickly realized after you know managing teams of people and going through all that, that the thing I loved about all the businesses that I'm ever involved in is giving my opinion, <laughs> <laughs> coaching. Um, but my wife will say it's about giving your opinion. I love to pontificate. <laughs> I love to give my opinion. <laughs> and, and I thought, well, why not wrap that up into you know teaching others? I can do it from home. Can do it in my office and I can I can have a global audience. And so three years back, that's what I, I basically transitioned to as a, a new business for me. And I started to um, coach these business owners. And you know, fast forward that a couple of years in a 75 different industries, clients in six different continents, and selling made social. Our goal is to take these business owners and show them how to effectively put in a sales funnel on LinkedIn. But you know, pretty much breaking the rules that people are following on LinkedIn for no other reason, except that's what they think they should be doing. Um, and there's a few key things that I do with clients that for them, it's, it's absolutely brand new to them. And the way that I use LinkedIn is still quite unique. Um, 
and um, it gets results. So, you know, that's the mission of, of Selling Made Social. And it all came from the stuff that I coach to and the stuff that I train these business owners. It all comes from doing B2B for the last two decades, right? It's, it's taking those principles, but bringing them online and, and modernizing it and compressing timeframes. Um, and it just works. And you know, I, I come from business development and running a business. I'm not a marketer. So the, the marketers that I see out there, they sell this story of like full automation, press a button, you'll get leads in the calendar. <laughs> la, 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 la. Oh, it's, yeah. easy. it's just not that easy, man. If it was that easy, I would pay them to do it for me as well. Yeah. And I haven't yet because it never works. Um, so that's what I do. That's one of the focuses in, in business that I do right now. Yeah, it sounds good. I know that um, selling on LinkedIn um, is can be quite difficult. Um, mm. uh, the funnels, I mean, what how you build a funnel in one platform, I guess, doesn't always work on, work on LinkedIn because it's just a different environment. It's- yeah, absolutely. And, and it, that's so true. And I see this over and over again. See, the way I approach it, when I, when I get someone approaching me and say, hey, Ty, I've heard about these funnels. Can you do it? And they always say, well, you know, I get two types of people. They say, well, I, I've, I've, I've used LinkedIn for years. I know about it. I just need this little tweak and I'm right. I'm like, oh, okay. And then I have people who are brand new and just like, this LinkedIn's weird. <laughs> what yeah, we it is weird when you start. Right? It's so different yeah. to other social yeah. media. So I get that. And I can ask them one question and it, it automatically... Um, shows them up for, well, actually, you don't really know what you're doing. Um, and that one question is I ask them, okay, you're a business owner and you're going, um, right? And they're like, yep, business owner. So you, all right, what's a resume used for? And they're like, for getting a job. I said, what are you trying to do? And they'll say, oh, get clients. So why do you have a resume on LinkedIn as your profile? Then they start to realize, wow, I've got the wrong tool for the job I'm trying to do. See, yeah. LinkedIn gives us all this space. And what everyone naturally does, because they kind of have these template that you follow, is they change it into your online resume. Well, someone with a problem and looking for a service, they don't care that you were the you know, food manager 10 years ago. <laughs> like They want to know what you can do for them now. So what I coach with my clients is we, we hijack LinkedIn. We use that space and we use those experience sections to talk about our services. So just like a landing page or one of those long, you know, mini websites that you just scroll down, yeah. we change it. So the profile, 95% of it talks about the now rather than 95% of your profile talking about the past. So literally each section, the way we use it, it converts into like, this is the introduction. These are my four key services that I sell, basically. Then section one, service one. Section two, service one. Then service two, service three. Okay, that's interesting. Right. Then we can put a section with a case study. Then we can have a call to action, like link, click here to book a call. So the profile completely changes. And I, I do, I use some AI heat mapping tools. And I can see when we run it on the before and after, we see a 300 to 500% increase in attention spots on the profiles. So that wow. means when someone lands on the profile, they're looking at the stuff we want them to look at. And we use formatting, we use subtitling, we use some fonts, we do some hacks. So the page, it doesn't look anything like a resume. It just becomes, they're like, how'd you do a landing page in this and that's, and, that, and that's what we do. And then, and then the next part, and you spoke about this, was, which was really good, that some things that work in like Facebook and Instagram, they don't work in LinkedIn. And, and the big thing is the way people speak to people on LinkedIn, when they reach out to people, the, the, the outreach on LinkedIn is atrocious. It yeah, is, yeah, it is the worst possible thing. And it hasn't changed since I've been on it since April 2004. It hasn't got any better. It's still no. horrible. Right. And, and the reason for that, and everyone's like, oh, I don't want to be spammy and salesy. And I, I try to give value first, right? They've been taught by marketers, give value, give value. Yeah. So what do they do? They connect and they think they're giving value. 
they send a message in LinkedIn. Hi, Rose, my name's Tyron. I'm a LinkedIn coach. I provide services, blah, blah, blah. Here's a download to look at. Here's a video to watch the 10 top things. And why don't you book a 15 minute call with your interested? Well, that gets like 5% response rate. Right? Yeah, I don't yeah. like them. I hate it. And, the, and I call it the value vomit. That's what I call it because yeah. it, it's not value. It is just vomit because you don't know what their problem is for you to provide value. That's you're it. just, you're just saying, well, this is what I think is important. And the, and the, the reason why that feels so spammy and salesy is you've got to think, how do we communicate in real life when we meet someone for the first time? What is the anatomy of a conversation? And I studied this. It goes like this. You meet someone for the first time, question, answer, question, answer, question, answer, anecdote or story, yeah. opin opinion, answer and question, and then another story. And then it goes deeper conversations. But what people do on LinkedIn is they walk in and they go opinion, story, yeah. uh, anecdote, you know, uh, call to action all in one hit. And you're wondering why people think it's weird because, you know, I'm 46 for 46 years of my life. I don't speak like that to people. No, I don't think anyone does really. Right? And for some reason, everyone throws it out on LinkedIn. And, and I use the analogy like in Japan, here in Tokyo, if you go to a networking event, pretty much all the men are wearing black suits, white shirts. Yeah. Right. It's like the uniform. Now imagine this, you walk into this networking event and there's about a hundred Japanese guys in there. And there's a guy in a pink suit, like he's wearing a neon pink suit, neon pink top hat. That's you. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's me. That's me on the weekends. Um, now in a networking event, you walk up to that guy. What's the first thing you're going to say to that guy? Well, like, really yeah. think about it. Yeah, how come you dress? How come you so you know you're unusual? Yeah, right. You're going to ask him about his pink suit. Like, why are you wearing that? Or where'd you get that? You know, what what made you wear that today? You're going to ask something about him. He's obviously wearing that pink suit because he loves it and he wants the attention. And you're recognizing that and stroking the ego a bit. Now, imagine if I use LinkedIn talk. I walk into the networking event. I see the man in the pink suit and I walk up to him and say, hi, my name's Tyron. I'm a LinkedIn guy. Here's my schedule. Would you like to book a time with me to talk about how to get leads off LinkedIn? And he's standing there in this pink suit. Yeah. You've like totally ignored the pink suit. Yeah. And that's what a person's profile is on LinkedIn. It's the pink suit. People want to talk about stuff that they've put out there. They're doing it deliberately. You don't write stuff up just like, well, I hope no one asks me about that. You, you put stuff out there for people to like get excited about. So, yeah. you know, you find the pink suit and start a conversation, emulate real life, find the pink suit, throw the pink suit in their messi in messenger imagery and ask that irresistible question. I love this suit. Where did you get it? The killer of conversations or the killer of deals in LinkedIn is that conversations never, ever start. They don't even get off the ground like no. five minutes like don't right but with that kind of question the pink suited man he's going to answer that question and it starts the conversation then when you study the anatomies of conversation a little bit further you can take them through a process and have a natural conversation that leads to the opportunity for them to say oh how did you do that lead generation for tom right? You, you, you structure your, your sentence or your conversation, you lead them through a discovery, actually find out that problem. And it can be done in minutes. But the thing about it, it's never, you know, all these marketers I see as well, they teach this, these drip fed stuff, right? Like send mm. a message. And then a day later, you get the second one, they ignore that. So they send a third one and fifth one. And that works in direct email. But Messenger is a live it's, it's called messenger for a reason, not inbox in LinkedIn. So it'd be like me walking up to you at a networking event saying, hi, Rose, I'm Ty, I'm the LinkedIn guy. And then turning away and walking off and then yeah. coming back like an hour later <laughs> like, and I do LinkedIn strategies and then walking away, right? So you've got to start seeing messenger differently. It's a place to start a natural conversation. And if you get the, the anatomy of your conversation right, and one of the easiest filters is, 
if this person was standing in front of me and with what I know of them and what my relationship is with them, would I say it in real life? And the answer, if you're typing something and you're like, no, I wouldn't say that. Delete it. Don't type it. And then think, what would I say? What's that pink suit? How would I start this conversation naturally? And then how do I follow up? That's the next part, right? And that, that's a whole yeah. different ball game. But that's that's why LinkedIn messaging and people selling on LinkedIn tend to suck are those two things. Their profile is a resume. It looks like everyone else. It doesn't showcase what they can do for you, the outcomes, the benefits. It doesn't answer any of the myths or objections that people have about your services. And then your outreach is atrocious. <laughs> I might and, have to get you to look at mine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, rip it apart. Yeah, as as you've got a thick skin. That's it. And it probably <laughs> needs a good, good uh, ripping apart, actually. Yeah. yeah so um, tell me why you actually moved to Japan. Right. So, I mean, that's. You know, the charges haven't been dropped in Australia yet, so I can't come back. No, that's that's not the reason. Um, I I was, from, from when I was about eight or 10 years old, I always wanted to be one of two things, one of three things. I wanted to get, wear a suit and carry a briefcase because my dad didn't. Um, I, I wanted to be the Prime Minister of Australia. And I, <laughs> yeah, and I wanted to be an army officer. They, they were the things I wanted so badly. My dad's a Vietnam veteran, and and uh, although he wasn't a big talker about his military service and war, it was you know always there. So from about twelve years old, I joined the army cadets, and I knew straight away I want to be an army officer. I want to go to the Australian Defence Force Academy when I'm eighteen, right? And I want to go there, become an officer. So for six years, like that was my focus. I did all the school council stuff. I did the army cadets. I did volunteer work, um, you know, studied. And I applied for the Australian Defence Force Academy scholarship. I got it. And then I found myself joining in 1993 in the army. So I achieved what I wanted. My brother had joined the army as well. Um, a lot of my mates were in the army. So I thought, this is awesome. This is what I wanted. I thought I would do 15 years maybe in the army, then go into politics and become the prime minister of Australia. <laughs> and, and during, and get to wear, you know, carry a briefcase and, and, and wear a suit because my dad was an engineer and just was like, like this. Right. Yep. Um, and I, I got in and um actually made inroads with back then it was the I think shadow minister for defense Peter Reith so I got to go to the parliamentary dining room for guests and stuff and I was like this is cool you know I'm gonna this is this is all coming together I got injured and um, I had multiple surgeries on my legs and it was just a mess and after graduating from the Australian Defense Force Academy basically my career was was over I, I can't yeah. run um, I, I've got a permanent disability. I can't run. I can't kneel. I can't squat my legs. There's constantly oh, dear me. Yeah. And when you get broken in the military, you become a bit like a leper because no one wants to see no. like, you know, that you, you're getting reminded like this could like happen. And you know, I was 23 years of age, turning 24 and my whole life for 10 years, I had like a quarter life crisis um, yeah. literally because you, you now get shipped away. You don't see your mates anymore. And they're out doing fun stuff, blowing up stuff and, you know, jumping out of planes and all the cool stuff that I wanted to do. Um, and um, I couldn't. So I was really just in a bad spot. And I, I applied to the um, Ministry of um, Intelligence, the Defence Department. I was going to actually become a spy. And that was really cool. I went through multiple testing. And then the last part, I didn't get selected. But it was literally like the final meeting was meeting in a hotel in Albert Park Lake. And like, my name is John Smith. If you pass this, you'll tell your family. It was really like that cloak and dagger. It was kind of wow. Awesome. Yeah. But I didn't get in and I was just like, this sucks. Life sucks. This is horrible. <laughs> you know? And I thought, I just, I need a challenge. I need to challenge myself, you know, after going through a defense Academy and be so intense and being surrounded with these people who are just amazing. I mean, they're really the, some smart, smart, um, super great leaders are, are there at the academy. You know, these are young guys and, you know, my class is now at Brigadier. Some are Lieutenant Colonel to Brigadier level, which is one step under general. So, you know, they're, they're, some have made it really high. Um, and I thought, I've got to get out of Japan. I was in hospital 
reading the newspaper. This was my third surgery on both legs. I'm like, there's this like work in Japan. I'm like, stuff it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, why, not? why not? And I literally within six weeks of that packed everything up uh, and just came to Japan, had a suit, one suitcase, literally. I knew no one. I went from August 1998 in Melbourne winter to boiling hot 36 degree oh, Tokyo wow. furnace. I get, get I get off the plane, get picked up, taken to my ho- uh, my room. It's this horrible 40 year old dingy apartment, <laughs> disgusting. A roommate who hadn't cleaned um, in the suburbs, like 20 minute walk from a station. I'm just like, oh my lord, what have I done? What have I done? This okay. sucks. And um, but then I met some good people. And, and then I, I quickly realized, man, there's so much opportunity here and there's so much money here. And this is, you've got to think 1998, you know, um, Australia, you know, compared the economy, um, Japan had just came off the bubble, but still, you know, you, you could make good bank here in Japan. Mm. And I'd go back to Australia and my one yen was worth two yen. So, you know, hundred bucks or 200 yeah. bucks, I, I was flush. And I quickly realized not only that, but in Tokyo, greater Tokyo, there's 30 million people. So the population of Australia is all within one city. Yes. And every company is represented and every embassy is represented. There's people from all around the world. And I just thought, man, there's so much opportunity here. Um, And I started to think, okay, well, I don't speak the language. I'm a foreigner, look different. Back then as well, there was half the amount of foreigners than there are now. Um, and I thought, well, these are, you know, strikes against me, but what, how can I use them? You know, everyone always talk about weakness and how to make a weakness a strength. And I've never really, you know, I was always like, well, what do you mean? What do you mean? And I quickly realized, okay, for me, it meant that I could skirt the rules of Japan business society, um, and use my foreignness and lack of, of, of Japanese as an excuse for kind of making mistakes yeah. and, and for bumbling around. And, and one of the classic examples was, you know, certainly when I went into the recruitment business as well, when you call on a company, um, if you're like a 25 year old, 26 year old Japanese sales dude, you're going to get matched up with a 25 year old Japanese dude. And that's, and then you're forcing the, the deal up the chain for the next six months. Well, as a foreigner and as this, I was seen as, Oh, this young hotshot, from out of Japan is here. And I would have meetings with the presidents. Yeah. And, and I never met a 25 year old sales dude. It was the president or the director of sales or the COO. And yeah. all my meetings were that because they, some of them were foreigners as well. So they'd like to see a foreign face with them. And there's that unity and understanding. And yeah, perception as well. Yeah. yeah. Right. That this guy knows what he's doing. And I talk differently. You know, because the way you do business in Japan, the way you have to use honorifics and lower yourself and blah, it's just yeah. so long, right? I was an Aussie. I, I use, I I hammed it up. I'd walk in the CEO again, hey, good to meet you, mate. And they'd be like, oh. And if they were Japanese, they actually even liked that because it was like, wow, novel for them to be yeah. spoken casually. And I wasn't scared because in Japan, if you're the president, they call it shacho. Everyone's like, oh, shacho, shacho. You know, they're really yeah. into that. And I just acted like, well, we're the same. You put your pants on like I do. Um, and it allowed me to skirt around. Um, the social niceties. The norms, everything. And, but I was always respectful. I've always been respectful of them. I don't, um, you know, break um, ethical behaviours and stuff no. like that. But I use my foreignness. I don't mind to stand out and be called a foreigner and outside the the, the norm because it allows me to you know, move. The same with taking responsibilities. I took on some projects. One of the big ones, um, we actually brought Al Gore to Japan for an event that I um, executive produced. And, you know, when we're sitting there making these meetings, when you ask people to take responsibility, everyone's like, Hurr. because they they like to distribute responsibility amongst a group. So therefore when it stuffs up, everyone takes a bit of responsibility. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm not for that. I will take responsibility. I will own it. And if it stuffs up, it's on me. Because for me, it didn't care. I didn't, I'm not going to shame my family. I didn't have any family here. <laughs> and, and if it doesn't work, I'm of the opinion like, okay, I'll learn from that and do it again. Whereas the Japanese, yeah. many of them, it's just like failure. You, it's so scary for them. And then yeah. they, it's just on them. And I didn't care. So when projects came up, I would like, yep. Oh, do and everyone, oh, okay. 
<laughs> but I was fine with it. I was taught as a, as a young army officer, like ownership. And you see yeah. Jocko Willick now talk about in his book, Ownership, and all the civilians like, oh, that's a fantastic book. And But it's normal for me. Like, you take responsibility. You own your decision. You own the outcomes. And even if it's someone underneath you that's stuffed up, it's on you as the leader. Mm. Um, so I, I use that, and it worked really well. And um, and then when people, you know, came up with ideas, I, I always challenged them. said, why do you do that? Like, how could we do that differently? They're like, I don't know how. I'm like, why don't we try this? And, you know, I took on their risk for them. I was happily to do that. And that allowed mm. us to, to change things. And, you know, in my wedding business in particular, when I first started, weddings in Japan were only done by these really large companies. There was a few large, large wedding industry companies and the hotels, and they ran the weddings. And it was like 30, 50, 60K a wedding. Like that was base wedding wow yeah. and i thought this is ridiculous like a dress i remember you know i got ordained as a minister to do ceremonies yeah. the only way you get married in japan is to, as, a, as a register but they like to do a western wedding so i got registered and in one of these um weddings i rudely asked the the the, the bride I said, oh i love this dress so how much does this cost you and she she in japanese they get mixed up with the numbers in english and japanese yeah. she's like oh you know, 3,700. I'm like, oh, okay, 3,700 bucks. I'm, okay, that's not bad. No, it's expensive. I mean, I'm thinking Aussie dollar, I'm like 6K, like, oh, wow. And she, I'm like, wow, so you own this and you'll, you'll keep it to your daughter. She says, oh, no, just renting. <gasps> and I was like, get out of town. That's exactly what my response was. I was like, huh? Renting. And then I realized 95% of the market in Japan, it's a rental market because they can't store things. They don't no. have the space. They wear it once. It's just for photos. They wear it for two hours at the location and then they're out of it. And I thought, I can do it better than three and a half K, surely to God. And literally when I was at my other work, I went online, found some dresses, had my partner and said, hey, can you make a website? And this is back before, you know, internet was really there. So yeah. we, she got Office Pro and made this like IBM front page and we got a customer, like somehow someone found it and we got a customer. And then we're like, oh, we don't have a location. What are we going to do? And my partner said, well, we can use my grandma's spare room at her house. I'm like, all right. So she had this Japanese tatami room, very gorgeous room. The couple came to the house out in the suburbs. We had seven dresses around the um, yeah. in Japanese rooms. Actually, you can actually hang stuff at, on just below the roof for kimonos yeah. and stuff. So we had that. And the couple rented from us and we rented it for like 400 bucks. And I thought, nah, we can, this is great. We can do this. And um, I convinced my partner, she was working um, at um, IBM. <laughs> I convinced her to quit that and said, because I can't do the Japanese part. Can you do that part? I'll do the ordering. I da, 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 da. And it just grew and grew and grew. And then we reached out to hotel instead of hotels. I thought, why don't we do restaurant weddings? Like restaurants are there on you know, certain times they can, they can hold a wedding in their restaurant. And she's, Oh, that's interesting. It's really in hotels. So we wrote letters to 50 um, restaurants and we got three that said, Oh, that would be a great idea. So then they started holding that. And now that's kind of normal now in Japan. Um, and, you know, pre COVID um, you know, this year is obviously it has been a big slowdown, but you know, last year, the average, you know, on the peak months up to 420 weddings a month. So we went wow. from one in my grandma, now she's my partner became my wife and, you know, my grandma-in-law's room to then, um, you know, 420 weddings a month, 30 odd staff. Uh, but it all came from, I saw that opportunity and I realized like, we, why, why are we doing that? That doesn't make sense to me. And because people in Japan, they just accept what they're told in yeah. many cases. And they, they kind of do. I mean, that's a gross generalization, but it's, they are quite compliant, which is, which is great because when you're in a city of 30 million, people can't be just doing their own thing. Everyone has mm. to put the group first. Um, and that's another thing I, I thought, well, I, I'm not going to do that. And um, being foreign just gave me a different set of um, eyes. Yeah. And, um, it's just, you know, flourish from there. I'm always looking any challenge that I get hit with. I just think to myself, where is the opportunity in this? Like there's got to be an opportunity in this for me somewhere, somehow, whether it's a learning point or, or changing the way that I behave or do something or business. Um, and 
then I'm always looking what's happening outside of Japan. What can I bring in here? Um, a system, a process, a software, whatever, uh, to make you know my life easier and make my clients' lives easier. Yeah. So why did you choose LinkedIn as a platform for, um, you know, making life better for B2B? Well, you know, now you look at it, when it first started back in, when I first found it, it was April 2004, and I was about the 470,000 user. Well, now there's 660 million people on it. So when you first joined, you used to get an ID number. That was the URL. That was your, yeah. your joining number. Now you can, you can customize it. So the beauty of LinkedIn now, and it's only growing and continuing to grow. And yes, it's it's going through phases and, and changing what kind of content goes on there and how people participate on there. But you've got to think like every person, if you look at the American markets, even the Australian markets, you've got about 75 to 85% of business people have an account on LinkedIn. Now active, that's a different story. But the thing is all your people are in one spot. Mm. Like, you know, everyone always talks about omnipresent and be on Instagram, be on Twitter, be on this, be on that. That's fine if you're Gary V, right? And you've got a team of guys <laughs> producing stuff. Yeah, if it's, it's just, very time consuming. Right, right. If it's just you, then just focus on one platform where the majority of your clients are and just engage in that one. Like, forget the others. Other, you know, until you've saturated one market or yeah. one space, then move to the next. And so, you know, LinkedIn for the majority of business owners, if their avatar are there on LinkedIn um, and they can identify them, like you can't say, well, look, I service women who are depressed after having a child. Like you, you, you LinkedIn's not appropriate right? no. because we can't identify that. But if you said I serve um, um, women um, founders of companies in the tech space or the food industry or the pharmaceutical, yeah, you can find them. If you can identify yeah. them by their, um, by their profession and make certain assumptions, then, then you can find them. So they're all in one spot. And the great thing about it, if you put in strategies that can make you look different to everyone else, i.e. landing page, i.e. reaching out to people for the pink suit, um, engagement strategies, then you can stand out in the noise of LinkedIn. You can. And um, it becomes highly predictable because, you know, if I reach out to, if, if you do testing of your messages, if I reach out to 50 CEOs of, you know, businesses with 200 or 500 people and I use this note, I'm going to get connected with, you know, 33 of them. When I send this um, framework, when I do the irresistible question, um, I get 60% response for owners. Right. Yeah. And you know, well, that gets me into 18 conversations. 18 conversations in Messenger leads to three appointments. If I have 10 appointments, I close one deal. It's just, it becomes predictable. Yeah, it's a no yeah. brainer, really, isn't it? Right. Rather than just putting content, this is what the marketers teach, which is, which has its place in a funnel. But if your trick is just do a post a day and do that for a year and hopefully then you kind of resonate. It's still unpredictable. You put one post out, you don't know who's going to reach out to you and say, you know, there's no predictability in that. Zero. No. Right? But it can enforce all the other parts of a sales funnel. But if you're a one trick pony, I mean, you, you're not doing it. So I just found that, you know, LinkedIn was an awesome place because they're all there. All you've got to do is stand in front of them because they're, they're going past you, the traffic, your prospects are going past and you just got to steer them towards you. Yeah. Um, if you do it, in a way that is not like everyone else, then you have a good chance of actually getting into real genuine conversations with people. And that's what leads um, to business. It's not these drip fed automatic six messages. You send it, it's ignored. So the next one, you put more detail, more value, get louder. They ignore that. Then you get louder again. It's like, stop. And then you can never go back and start a conversation with those people as well. Right, mm. because as soon as you go back to like oh, six months later, I'll, I'll check on. As soon as you write your message and it comes up, they see the six previous ones they ignored. And yeah, like, oh, that guy again. Whereas my approach, they see something about them, they see an irresistible question. Maybe for whatever reason, that time they were busy, they didn't think about it, and it still looks different and unique. And you can re-engage people. Yeah, I'm always thinking like, don't burn your bridges on LinkedIn. 
No. So, Tyron, where can people reach out to you to get a hold of this magnificent um, funnel of yours? Yeah. So um, there's a couple of things. I'm on... Uh, I have a Facebook group, you know, let's have the LinkedIn groups. They, they killed them off. They're horrible. Uh, but I have a Facebook group called LinkedIn sales funnels for entrepreneurs. So that's a public group. And um, you can get me on email at admin, go straight to me, admin at sellingmadesocial.com. Um, and you can find me on LinkedIn. Like I'm the only Tyron Giuliani in the entire world. So. Um, wow. That's a. Uh... That's uh, unique then, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it helps on Google, but people always mess up Giuliani's spellings. But um, just like the mayor of Julia, uh, mayor of uh, former mayor of New York. But that's yes. how you can find me. He's in a bit uh, of trouble at the moment. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You're not related, are you? <laughs> I'm not, but I, I do like making comments like Uncle Rudy did this this time. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, Tyron, thank you so much for your time today. I've so enjoyed the conversation and I actually learned a lot. So I might uh, I might uh, reach out to you on LinkedIn and you can um, look at my page and give me some hints. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. Thank you. For your time. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Enjoy your day. Bye. Bye.